few years ago, I was telling my friend Patrick that I was thinking of buying a new car. And I told him about some of the features that I was considering, like uh, leather seats, premium sound system, and navigation. And he encouraged me to get these features. He said something about how they would serve me well in my impending midlife crisis. So later, in the same conversation, I told Patrick that, I was, that one of the cars I was thinking of it was an electric vehicle. But this time, he asked me what would be the payback for the extra cost of electric over gasoline. In other words, how long until the savings in gas equaled the extra cost of the electric car? And that got me thinking, well, I, you know, I thought, why, does, why do we apply financial metrics to some, met to, to some uh, purchases, but not others? Like, why didn't he ask me about the payback for the leather seats? And it seems to me that this often happens with uh, purchases that have some environmental impact. And that's when I realized that I have a problem with payback. You see, payback measures the benefit for the purchaser only. But what about the rest of us? Like in the case of an electric vehicle, there are benefits like reduced greenhouse gas emissions and improved air quality, and they benefit everybody, not just the purchaser. So that got me thinking, this is kind of like a pay forward, because these are benefits that uh, apply to all of us long into the future. Now, both payback and pay forward are important. Payback provides the financial justification for the purchase, but pay forward takes into account the benefits for all of us into the future. And I think there's lots of examples of purchases that provide both the financial payback and an environmental pay forward. And I'd like to tell you about three projects that I've done over the past 15 years that have turned out to be both financially and environmentally rewarding. And I, I kind of think of these projects like bricks. You know, on their own, they don't actually accomplish much, but as you'll see, when put together, they actually have uh, turned into to building something pretty substantial. So the first project was solar pool heat. So um, we have a pool, and back in 2003, we had an electric pool heater that was starting to fail. So I took that opportunity to investigate solar pool heat. And if you're not familiar with it, the way solar pool heat works is uh, there's a pump that circulates water through the pool, and instead of putting it through the electric heater, it pumps it up to the roof, and there's tubes that, uh, run, that the water runs through. The sun you know, absorbs the energy from the sun and heats up the water. Um, it's a great system, and on a sunny day, the pool can rise in temperature by up to 10 degrees Celsius, and it's all free. Now, the problem with solar pool heat is that it's a little more expensive. So in this case, it was, the additional cost was $3,700. But the operating cost for solar pool heat is zero. So that saved me $600 per year. So from a payback standpoint, that was 6.2 years. And from a pay forward, the energy savings were about 4,000 kilowatt hours per year. And the, uh, that means that the associated greenhouse gas emissions that were saved were about 1,600 kilograms per year. So fast forward a couple years, and in 2005, we decided to add on to our house. And in doing so, we were going to exceed the capacity of our heating and cooling system. So, this gave me an opportunity to investigate alternatives, and I looked into geothermal. Geothermal, or ground source, if you're not familiar with it, the way it works is the, the temperature of the ground about two meters below the surface is a constant 12 degrees Celsius. And the great thing about 12 degrees Celsius is that on a hot summer day, 12 degrees feels pretty cool. And on a cold winter day, 12 degrees feels pretty warm. So what they do is they dig a trench, they lay down a tube, and they run fluid through it, and it takes advantage of that difference in temperature to heat and cool the house. It's a very, very efficient system. The problem is it's expensive for the upfront investment. And in this case, the extra cost was $13,000. But the operating cost is very low. So it saves me $1,700 a year in energy. 
And so the payback turns out to be 7.7 years. And from a pay forward standpoint, the energy savings were 11, uh, just a little over 11,000 kilowatt hours. That's about a quarter of my energy bill was reduced just by putting in geothermal. And the associated greenhouse gas reductions were over 4,600 kilograms. That's the equivalent of taking one car off the road. So we were pretty happy with that. And fast forward a few years more, and in 2014, I actually did buy that electric vehicle, and I did get the leather seats and all the other stuff that Patrick suggested. And in 2015, the Ontario government had the MicroFit program. And that was a program where they would commit to a long-term 20-year contract to buy power that, that anybody produced using a solar installation. So we went ahead and we put in a 10 kilowatt rooftop solar pan uh, panels and the whole installation. The cost for that was $29,000. Now that system generates $4,500 per year so the payback is 6.4 years. The pay forward, because it generates 11,500 kilowatts a year of, of energy, uh, and it, the associated reductions for greenhouse gases were 4,600 kilograms. That's like taking another vehicle off the road. So in summary, and there's a lot of numbers on this chart, but really just if you think of the bottom line, these three projects combined uh, result in taking 11,000 kilograms a year of greenhouse gases we're, that we're not producing. And the total payback for all three of those projects is 6.7 years. Now, 6.7 is not a great payback. It's okay, but it's not great. But the point is, we didn't make our decision based solely on the payback. We took into account those other benefits like the uh, environmental uh, improvements and all of those things, the pay forward. And we balanced the two of those and decided that the combination was, was the right thing to do and made us want to proceed. So here's a, here's a graph of our energy consumption over the last 15 years. Nick said I was an engineer, so I like to measure things, so you get the sense of, of all this. Um, so I've superimposed some of the key milestones along the way. And you'll see that starting from the left-hand side, you know, in 2004, that was our first year of, of full solar pool heat. And you can see our energy went down by about 10%. And then we start building that house addition, and we start using more and more energy because of that. And then we put in geothermal, and 2007 is the first full year of geothermal, and that's that dramatic drop in energy uh, consumption. That's about a 25% drop in my energy consumption. And then we carry on pretty flat for a number of years. I buy the electric vehicle at the end of 2014 because we charge it uh, at home at night. The consumption starts to go up again. And then in 2015, we put in solar, and so you see that other big drop in our net energy uh, consumption, another 25% drop in energy consumption. Now, compare that to these gray bars, and the gray bars are what my energy consumption would have been if I hadn't done these three projects. And you see some pretty big differences there. At, by the end of it, by the end of 2017, my energy consumption is about half of what it would have been had I not done those things. So, and that's the energy savings as well as all of the associated greenhouse gas and, and, um, and environmental benefits. So that's the pay forward. And you know, now you see what I mean when I say that, you know, those individual projects, they didn't sound too good, but when you look at it over time and you look at the combined effort, these are, those are the bricks that I was talking about that ended up building something, I think, pretty substantial. So what's the next project for me? Uh, well, we're starting to investigate uh, uh, energy storage for the home. So this would be a residential size battery that we would use as backup. Uh, it could replace something like a, a diesel generator uh, in case we ever lose power. But it can also be something that we would charge with solar power uh, or charge up using really low cost power in the off peak times and then using that power in uh, uh, high peak times where the power is more expensive. So we would save a fair amount of money. But I'm still calculating the payback 
and of course the pay forward for that. So what does this mean for all of us? Well, I know not everybody can, you know, has the room to put in geothermal or wants to spend the money up front for some of these things, but I do think there's some important lessons. And sometimes some of these environmental things can seem daunting. You know, the, the problems are so big, what can one person do? But I do think there are some things that we can do. First of all, clean technology is advancing very quickly. And the paybacks and the pay forwards are improving so rapidly all the time. So I encourage you to think about these things, um, you know, do the calculations, and maybe you've thought about them a few years ago, but revisit them because everything is improving very, very quickly. Second, if you notice, two of my projects were based, were, were driven by replacement decisions. So my pool heater died, so I had to do something, or we built onto the house and I had to replace the heating and cooling system. So it's easy to, you know, no, nobody's going to, you know, take out a perfectly good piece of equipment just to put in something that's a little more efficient. But when you have to make a change, that's when you can make the greatest impact. So even though it's a little more time consuming, it requires a little more effort to do the research, find out what the alternatives are, of course calculate the payback and the pay forward, that's when you can really make a difference. Another lesson, I think, is to pay attention to how we talk about payback and financial returns. You know, when, you, when we talk about payback, we talk about how long, how long until the savings equal the extra cost. But that kind of implies that the, the benefits end once the payback has been achieved. But that's not the case at all. Those, those savings continue long into the future. In the case of my projects, uh, already they've generated over $35,000 of savings. So instead of thinking about how long until we achieve the payback, we should think about how much the savings are going to be over the lifetime of that piece of equipment or that asset. If we do that, then our mindset will probably be more, more positive towards that purchase. And finally, if you're talking to somebody and they're, talking, and they're considering you know, a hybrid or an electric vehicle or some kind of a clean technology decision, you know, by all means, ask them about the payback, but also ask them about the pay forward. Get them thinking about the benefits, not just to themselves, but to everybody else. And see if you can get them to take both payback and pay forward into consideration when they make their decision. Because if they do that, every time that happens, that's one more brick that gets put toward building a better world. Thank you.